Welcome to Knox Vintage Records, Vintage Record Auction number 74, Highlight Reels. We are going to be covering records in this catalog. Most of you have already received it. Hopefully all of you who are on our mailing list have already received it. It went out about five weeks ago. This is a catalog comprised of 78 RPM, Edison Diamond Disc, radio transcription, and cylinder recordings. And there's roughly seven or 8,000 lots in here. So in our highlight reels, what we're going to do is just kind of go through some of the stuff in the catalog, which is either very valuable, very interesting, or has some sort of aesthetic appeal that might not really come through in the uh, printed page. Now, of course, those of you who get the catalogs know that we do have lots of nice uh, label images of records that are in the catalog on the uh, four cover panels. Uh, and also, we have the highlights page on the 78rpm.com website where you can go and click through a slideshow of some of the more interesting lots in the catalog. You'll see probably maybe 150 to 200 images or so there. Uh, but the highlights reels are something that we started putting together a few years ago just to... Uh, uh, satiate the appetite of uh, the most rabid record collectors out there who just can't get enough of really cool stuff. So we're going to show you some really cool stuff over the next whatever it might be two or three hours. Uh, so we're going to go pretty quick because there is an awful lot to cover. Some really really great things in this catalog. Those of you who have already been through it uh, understand that. Uh, we do this kind of also in tandem with the Bitter Request Show. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But uh, let's just kick off right from the beginning. The uh, Again, the catalog can be found at 78rpm.com. So if you don't actually have a hard copy, just go to 78rpm.com, click on the Current Auction tab, and there you'll be able to open up a PDF file of this entire list. As we go, I'm going to be talking about something called lot numbers. A lot number is the record... Uh, is the number of the record as it corresponds to the catalog. So on our sleeve, it's at the upper right-hand corner here. In this case, we have lot number four. And so that is the identifying number of every uh, item in the catalog. So when you go to your catalog or to the PDF file, open it up, you'll see in this leftmost column a uh, list of numbers. That is the lot number that we're talking about there. So, let's get started. I will try to mention the lot numbers of everything that uh, that I see, but, you know, maybe I, I'm sure I'll forget some. I always do. So, you have a pause button on your video. You know how it works. Uh, if I'm missing uh, a lot number and you're interested in it, just back it up, pause it, and you can pick it up off of the, uh, uh, the record sleeve. And if you don't, you can find it, which uh, I should mention... By opening the PDF file, you can search on something. So if I show you a DeFord Bailey Victor scroll in M minus condition, I don't mention the lot number, but it's a record that you want, then just go to the PDF file and uh, search for DeFord Bailey, and you'll come up with it. So anyway, pretty simple stuff. Let's get started. We're going to begin with the first section in the catalog, which are the Berliner uh, discs. Berliner recordings were made in the 1890s by Emil Berliner, the guy who developed the disc recording process. Uh, these were issued here in the United States on 7-inch pressings, single-sided, nothing on the back, typically, certainly no recording, and uh, no paper label. It's all uh, just engraved into the, uh, the matrix itself. So what we have in this particular catalog are some exceptionally important and very, very rare uh, Personality items. Here we see the 91st Psalm by D.L. Moody. That's Dwight Moody, considered to be the greatest evangelist of the 19th century. He made two recordings for Berliner at the same recording session, and there are two copies known of each of those uh, of each of those recordings. So this is one of the two known copies of this record, an extremely important recording historically, spiritually, and uh, for anyone who's interested in spoken word records. This has a $10,000 yeah, 10, minimum bid in the catalog. It's recorded January 17th uh, in New York City, 1898. 
Okay, we're not going to spend that much time on every record, but at $10,000 it warranted a mention. This is uh, Signor Giannini, one of the uh, first true uh, opera singers to record, uh, to record period on any format. And this is one of his Berliners. I'm showing you the entire record because, uh, as you can see, the label area of these can be larger than the opening of the 7-inch discophiles. This is um, uh, ah, Chauncey Depew. He was a, a New York senator, a uh, very famous orator, and uh, this is one of his, I believe, three recordings for Berliner. This is speech on Forefathers Day. It's got a $1,000 minimum bid. That previous record uh, by Giannini is a $200 minimum bid. This one is uh, Rip Van Winkle, the toast scene from that, by Joseph Jefferson. Joseph, Joseph Jefferson was a famous actor who made his life's career out of playing Rip Van Winkle in that production. All right, this next one. This is uh, an Alice Nielsen Berliner, even though she's not actually on the, the record. This is uh, the uh, Schoolgirls Chorus from The Fortune Teller. Um, she starred in that uh, production. Here is a label on the back. I mentioned uh, that uh, Berliners typically don't have anything on the back, which is true, but sometimes you'll, you might find a sticker. One of the important things about Berliners is that generally speaking the artist signature will be found in the wax which is very cool now that you know that uh, is in the stamper itself so it exists on every copy of the record that's pressed so it's not like the ones with signatures are vi more valuable than ones without but here we see a berliner that does not have a signature well on the back to rectify that situation miss nielsen writes this statement saying hey even though i forgot to sign a record it's still uh, under my name and I want you to be assured that you are getting a legitimate product that uh, has my uh, approval. Isn't that cool? All right, next Berliner is lot number 12. This is uh, by Ada Rehan, a very famous actress of her day. And she's giving two selections here. Catherine uh, from uh, The Taming of the Shrew by Shakespeare and The Country Girl. Um, this, there's a, something very, very interesting about this record. We don't have time to get into it, but I would encourage you to listen to the Bitter Request Show, and uh, you will hear that and hear it explained. That's very cool. By the way, both Ada Rehan and Joseph Jefferson uh, had victory ships named after them in World War II. That's kind of neat. This is lot number 14. This is a $200 minimum bid. This is Cal Stewart, uh, Uncle Josh, at the museum pretty scarce record and something that will be of interest to a lot of people. All right, so we, there are more Berliners in the auction, but those are some of the really special ones. This is an interesting record that I pulled out. Um, first of all, it was by Jules Levy, who was considered to be the greatest cornetist of his time. But aside from that, it uh, has this uh, unusual label at the top here. You see, it's a gramophone company pressing out of England with the recording angel at the top. Nothing unusual about that. But you see the Victor Talking Machine Company indication, which they printed on the label of the uh, uh, American recordings that were issued under their imprint in England. So that's kind of a neat uh, little label variety. A lot of people have not seen that. And very... Very few people have seen one of these. This is an exceedingly rare record. So people are familiar with uh, Red Seal Records. Um, here is a, uh, an example much later of a Victor Red Seal pressing. Okay, the Red Seal was Victor's, later RCA Victor's, uh, label for their operatic and classical stuff you know that was their high-end sort of material and um, that actually was started in russia in december of 1901 the very first red seal records came out the gramophone company and the victor talking machine company were like sister companies they divided up the world victor got north and south america and japan the gramophone company got everything else but they shared masters they shared the nipper logo 
uh, a lot of uh, synergy in those two companies. They shared artists and so forth. Uh, so the gramophone company was operative in Russia. Uh, they decided to, to do a special red label record for their very important high-end operatic artists. And uh, this is an example of that. Only in Russia do we have red labeled uh, seven inch discs. And the red labeled discs were the only ones that had this very interesting uh, title on them. Gramophone record red seal. Uh, in case you weren't aware that you were looking at a red seal, then you could read it right there on the label. The, uh, the 10 inch uh, Russian red seals do not say that. So, uh, so this is a very rare and unusual, uh, very desirable uh, label variety, and it features very desirable artists. This is Anastasia Vyaltseva, uh, a Russian uh, soprano, and either the first or the second woman to have uh, to appear on that uh, uh, Russian Red Seal uh, label. Uh, she this the recording I just showed you was originally issued as a Berliner recording in Russia. So in order to make the recording on a uh, uh, paper label issue, they had to create a second stamper. Otherwise, you would have all of the Berliner uh, imprint visible underneath this label. So any uh, issue on the Red Seal label uh, that had originally appeared as a Berliner, you will not find a stamper one copy with the, the label because they had they created a stamper two from that from the Berliner itself. So uh, if, if you gather my drift, anybody w who w appeared with the Red Seal label where that was the very first label of issue, then, then you might find a stamp or one copy. All right, next we have uh, a uh, uh, interesting Russian uh, G&T pressing. It was very similar to that, but of course it's a, a normal black seal or black label uh, with a Cyrillic type. This has a very nice little uh, uh, tax stamp with a uh, uh, Nipper and the uh, Berliner there at the top. Okay. These all come out after the Berliner section in this catalog. We have a, a short uh, listing of Gramophone Company 7-inch pressings. That's what all these are from. So here is a, uh, a recording from Barcelona. Same idea as what we saw before. The nice thing about that is it has one of these original sleeves. I'm not going to pull the sleeve out of this bag because I have one loose here I'm going to show to you. That was lot number 30 for $50 minimum bid. Eventually I'm going to get into the hang of that. Uh, here we have the same thing, another uh, recording from Barcelona that has uh, more of a matte finish label as opposed to the uh, glossier black label. And this is what the sleeve looks like. You get the sleeve with this record as well. Very, very nice Barcelona dealer's sleeve. You don't find sleeves for uh, early uh, recordings very often. But when you do, they can be very attractive, as in this case. I neglected to notice when I was putting minimum bids in the catalog that this record actually comes with the original sleeve, which is why it doesn't have a very high minimum bid on it. So those of you who are watching this video, will be aware that that record has a sleeve. The people who are just looking at the catalog may not notice that it does have one. So you might be able to get that uh, much cheaper than you normally would. Uh, this is lot number 61. This is an improved uh, seven inch record, American label. Uh, not anything particularly special, but this is what we call a pre-dog victor that has a least notice at, to at uh, the top instead of the uh, dog that we normally see. And just to wrap up the seven inch material in this auction, so we can move on to larger sizes, I'll just briefly show you this. This is the uh, Mother Goose talking book. Talking books were very uh, uh, neat records. Uh, that were typically attached to cardboard cutouts. In this case, instead of a, a figure like the baby or the parrot or whatever, we have it mounted inside of a book. Uh, these are very, very highly collectible 
uh, today. So these typically bring uh, a fair amount of money. If you wanted to play this on your uh, phonograph, you see there's a spindle on this side. You just bend that back and you put the whole thing on your turntable. So you don't need to detach it from the book itself in order to play the record. That is lot number 705 with a $50 minimum bid. Okay, so that basically takes care of our little stuff. Put these away. And uh, one more record here. Uh, this is from our acoustic section, 10 inch. I just show this because this is another copy of a Joseph Jefferson uh, recording. This is the uh, Columbia Conditions label that it's on. It's lot number 140 with a $50 minimum bid. Here again, he's performing something out of Rip, uh, Rip Van Winkle. Rip uh, meets Meany after 20 years absence. So after Rip wakes up, uh, that's what this is from in the production. Again, he made his entire life career playing that one character. Kind of interesting, but I think that would become incredibly dull after a short period of time. Okay, now, um, those of you who have seen these auction highlights videos in the past understand that uh, uh, we go through all of the, quote, uncommon American record labels. Now, we started selling uh, my personal collection of American commercially issued pre-war labels uh, several catalogs ago. We're doing it chunk by chunk because there are so many of them. Not every record in each one of those listings is in, by any means uncommon because I'm trying to, uh, or I try to collect all of the major uh, label varieties and types. Uh, so you're going to find some incredibly common records here, but they were collected based on the label and not on the music or artist. That being said, there's some incredibly rare music and artists on these labels. I'm going to flip through these very, very quickly. Again, you've got a pause button on your video, so if you need to see something, linger on it a bit, look at uh, typeface or what have you, then avail yourself of that. We're going to go quickly. In this particular auction, we are doing labels beginning with O through R. Okay, O through R is what we're looking at. We're not looking at any other size labels uh, than 10 inch. Uh, we'll be covering 7 inch, 12 inch, and others uh, in future catalogs. So we're looking at 10 inch O through R American pre-war, generally commercially issued labels beginning with Odeon. Odeon was a company that started in Europe. Uh, I think around 1902, uh, an American branch formed, and these earliest labels say American Odeon Corporation on the bottom. Shortly after that, it was dropped, as you see here. Uh, I'm not going to describe the differences between all of these. For that, you can go to your catalog. It will give you more information. Uh, that's a green one, an orange one. These were used for various series as many labels did they use different colors for different series and uh, we're just going to flip through these um, you'll notice here as we go that uh, there's going to be like I said some artists uh, here's the uh, here's Roy Smack people collect him a nice E minus copy condition of that particular record um, at this point we've gotten into the point where uh, Odeon and OK had merged and been purchased by the Columbia uh, company. So now, at this point, these are being made by Columbia. Okay, that's so much for Odeon. Now let's go to the official Boy Scout record. You've probably seen these in previous uh, auction videos. There was a series of four or five of those that came out. This right here is a uh, Marsh Autograph Company pressing out of Chicago. Uh, we featured a whole run of these a few catalogs back. Uh, Marsh Autograph Pressings are very collectible and of interest to collectors because it was the very first label to uh, feature electrical recording. So uh, uh, typically these labels can uh, uh, have electrical performance that predate Victors and Columbia's by uh, two or three years. So interesting from a uh, uh, recorded sound perspective. I mentioned that OK and Odeon merged. This is the OK label. 
Uh, your very first OK labels were vertically recorded, as this is. Very attractive labels that they started out with. I just find that the uh, the design on here is is uh, super neat. You got the Indian, you got the little red logo at the top. Um, that was that variety was simplified, where they took off all the scroll work and so forth. I, I like the earlier one better. In fact, uh, you will see that this one has the later variety on this side, so you get a twofer. If you uh, want both varieties, you only have to buy one record to get it. Uh, these were still uh, vertically recorded, but then they switched over to the lateral system once the uh, patent had expired and OK and Jeanette were successful in court uh, fighting Victor over that. Uh, the judge found in their favor, and so now the lateral recording process was opened up to anyone, and everybody pretty much switched over to it, with the exception of Edison and Pathé. So here we have uh, lateral and big type here, so you don't screw it up by playing it with the wrong stylus. This is a different re okay recording from the ones that you guys have been getting. Here we have the same thing. Apparently this was kind of an expensive label. I mean, you can see we're using different color inks and so forth. Uh, so they went to a maroon and gold label, which they used for a pretty long period of time. But again here, it's it's uh, right after the one we just looked at, therefore lateral is indicated in uh, big type right across the middle. Okay. Well, eventually we lost the Indian and the seal at the top with further simplification, and we came down to this. And this would be the OK style for some time. Here is uh, one of their ethnic series. They typically uh, would show a little bit of a New York skyline here, Statue of Liberty. Uh, these were uh, largely targeted towards the American immigrant population. Uh, most of whom came through uh, Ellis Island and uh, on their entry to the United States. And so this would have been uh, kind of a familiar scene uh, to those individuals. Many of them, of course, uh, if they did come in that way, they would have been greeted by uh, the Statue of Liberty. So kind of a neat uh, label there. All of these things have something a little bit different. It could be the uh, company name at the bottom. It could be the presence of a registration notice underneath the logo. It could be typeface. It could be any number of different things. OK introduced what they call the True Tone process, which they hyped with this True Tone lozenge here. Um, your very early uh, Louis Armstrong and his Hot Fives and so forth typically were would have been issued with that label. Uh, and uh, very, very desirable. Unfortunately for OK, uh, not long after they introduced the True Tone process, they, uh, uh, the electrical process was, uh, was introduced and uh, they licensed that. Actually, it was done through Columbia uh, and the True Tone lozenge was dropped. This is a, a later Columbia OK label, but with a uh, an acoustic recording on it. The OK Laughing record was one of the greatest selling records or recordings of all time. came out on several different labels. And uh, if you haven't heard that, uh, you owe it your, to yourself to give it a listen. All right, here is uh, just a maroon uh, OK with a type at the bottom that uh, we see the same sort of type and patent information on a Columbia issue. Uh, here's another OK label. I'm not sure if these are actually in uh, all in lot number order because I've we we typically separate out the higher dollar value stuff from the lower dollar value stuff just to kind of keep it uh, protected. Uh, but for this video, I try and sort them back in order so that we can pretty much go uh, numerically through lot number in the catalog. But um, the reason I say that is that this label predates this label. They are, uh, they are in lot number order, so they're a little out of order that way in the catalog. Sorry about that. Here is a black label True Tone. All right. So uh, we see the, the uh, uh, maroon label, very prominent in OK's early stages. Then they start doing a black label, and then we will start seeing a couple of other colors pop up here shortly. 
Okay, here's a Sam Lanin. Now we see electric in the lozenge. So they've dropped true tone, now they're into the electric process. Here is a blue uh, label, Louis Armstrong. Um, I don't know if you can really pick this up, Raquel, but there is actually a Louis Armstrong autograph on this label. Unfortunately, it's pretty weak and pretty faded, but it is in fact there. Can you see that? Nope. Well, maybe if I... Maybe slightly. Does that help any? That is slightly helping. You can make out... It may look terrible to you, but it looks terrible uh, to me as well. So there's not much to make out unless you have a microscope or something. Anyway, um, if you want something that you know that Louis actually laid his hand on, this would be it. If you're looking for a great copy of his autograph, maybe not so much. All right. Nice electric label by uh, Seeger Ellis. Seeger uh, actually got his own label on the uh, on OK. He's he uh, moved over from uh, uh, Columbia. No, uh, from Victor. Seeger moved from Victor to OK, and they gave him his own silver label with his picture on it uh, as an enticement to uh, switch companies. Uh, Seeger was both a pianist and a singer. I was fortunate to get to become a good friend of his towards the end of his life. He lived here in Houston. Okay, uh, moving right along. I haven't been noting lot numbers, but uh, for this stuff it's probably not that important. You can pick it up in the catalog pretty easily. But, that being said, this is lot number 344 with a $50 minimum bid. Typically, the records that uh, I have in the label section are going to be in pretty nice shape because I always tried to upgrade the label as much as possible. And I was upgrading based on label, not content. So if I had a really nice OK by uh, Sybil, Sybil Sanderson Fagan uh, doing a whistling solo and it was in better shape with a label than a Louis Armstrong Hot 5, I would bump the Louis and put in the Sybil. Uh, but in some cases, I... I my best labels were with great artists. Um, this is Tommy Bond uh, Orchestra. You'll find the same label on a uh, an Odeon issue. Okay, and Odeon were basically the same, and also Parlophone at that time, all uh, kind of sub labels of Columbia. Here's another uh, Electric Blue. Here's an electric green. You know, to be honest with you, I'm not really sure what the blue is all about. Um, you'll find uh, Louis Armstrong and uh, Casaloma Orchestra and so forth on the blue label. Uh, I don't really know why they did that, because uh, you also find them on uh, maroon and later black label as well. But certainly the green label, that was in, uh, done for the Irish series. And... Uh, You've got green wax to go along with it, so those are pretty cool. I strongly recommend that you don't hang those on the wall because they fade and turn a pea green over time. Again, all of these different labels have a little bit of different stuff going on with them, and we'd be here all afternoon, maybe even two afternoons, to describe what, what all those differences are. And then this is the final iteration of the OK label. It came out uh, uh, much later, towards the later uh, 1930s. Uh, might as well mention while we're here that a record like this could be also found the exact same size uh, on a blue and gold Vocalion label from the same time period. The OK and the Vocalion labels typically were uh, offering the exact same things. Um, not everything in each label catalog was going to be issued on the other label as well, but, uh, but they do share that, that similarity. Now we go to Olympic. Uh, Olympic has uh, different colors and different information down here at the bottom. So here's a black. There's a blue. The purple series was uh, what they were going to be using for opera. Uh, and here we have Tannhäuser as the uh, opera and then a little write-up on it on it and everything. So kind of 
this is kind of like uh, some of those explanatory talk Edison diamond discs or uh, maybe more so your Victors that have the label on the back of the uh, red seal that talks a little bit about the recording. Olympic was doing the same thing. They could have put something on the back. They didn't. They just put a little blurb on the front cover or the front of the label. Here's a red Olympic. Now you'll notice that all of these I've shown you say Olympic at the bottom. Now we go to a Black Olympic that shows the Fletcher Record Company. A little bit of change in uh, corporate status there. Now we have a Fletcher Blue and Green and Red. Then after Fletcher we move to Capital Roll and Record Company out of Chicago. So Olympic Red, now Capital. So all of those are just reflective of the various ways that uh, record companies will restructure, reorganize, consolidate, merge, what have you. Here is an only phone uh, record. I've got it inside a, a plastic sleeve inside to keep it from getting torn because this is a paste over label and uh, pulling it in or out of a sleeve it can get caught on something and torn. The only phones that I've seen do not really have catalog numbers. In fact, it's all typewritten anyway. It's not even printed on the label. Uh, and then the catalog numbers are either uh, put on with a sticker like this or they are handwritten. Uh, I've, all the only phones I've seen have the uh, half inch, uh, quote, standard size spindle hole. And, uh, and they're all single sided. They come in two label varieties, I've noticed. We see here that Talking Machine Company is straight, and the other variety is where it's curved. So we have an arch here versus straight, and the typeface is a little different, and so forth. But that's really the primary uh, uh, deal. Spencerville, Ohio. Pretty, pretty small and obscure company. As, as I said, this one is on a sticker, catalog number 11. This one is just written in. In fact, they wrote something on it and they uh, screwed up and they wrote over it. Pretty low budget item there. All right. Now we're going to go to a label that actually was not made in the United States. These were made in Germany. This is Opera Phone. Opera so Phone was sold in the United States uh, in the early 1920s until a uh, injunction was... Uh, granted to the Victor Talking Machine Company that prohibited uh, the sale of opera phones in the United States because these all derive from gramophone company pressings. These are uh, pirates of those pressings. It occurred after uh, the, the catalog uh, was transferred to uh, uh, Deutsche Gramophone after World War One, and so they started uh, taking gramophone company pressings uh, pressing them up on opera discs, sending them into the United States. So you would have artists on these labels, like Caruso, for instance, that were contractually committed to Victor and Gramophone, and now uh, Victor was competing against Operaphone with these uh, recordings that they actually had rights to. So that's why uh, Operaphone was basically shut down. Now, Operaphone typically is a blue, uh, tan, and uh, black... Uh, label. This one is uh, green because it's uh, this particular one is Swedish. But um, again, they use the different colors for different uh, uh, ethnic groups or uh, music varieties. There's a tan one, and uh, I guess I don't have an opera disc blue here at 10 inch. It, it would be represented with a 12 inch record. Uh, which we will get to in another catalog. Now we move to Operaphone. Operaphone was a, uh, another vertical American label. Uh, you see here at the top it shows a picture of the sound box facing forward. forward. So it says, play on all universal tonar machines with sound box facing uh, front. So a universal machine is a machine where the sound box would rotate 
in one uh, orientation to play a lateral record and another orientation to play a vertical record. So they're showing you here on the label exactly how to set it up. But they say on the bottom it says play it with a steel needle and as opposed to a, uh, a sapphire ball like you would use with a uh, Pathé uh, recording. So during this period of time, late teens up to about 1920, um, things could be played in different ways and you need to make sure that you were playing the right record on the right machine with the right type of stylus so you didn't mess it up. Here's the same thing in blue. And brown. Then we go to a different variety. Here's Opera Phone um, with a uh, nice little uh, record featured at the top. I'm thinking that these were universal uh, grooved recordings. Um, a universal groove is one which is kind of an intermediate between lateral and vertical so that you could technically play it either way. But when you do that, you kind of sacrifice a lot in sound quality so it might play, but it's not going to sound very good either, either way. Um, here's the, the green, here's the purple, here's the red. I'm not, I, I don't recall exactly if uh, Opera Phone was universal or not. Um, slips my mind, so don't quote me on that. Okay, here we have Opera Phone in solid gold letters. That's the way we've seen it on all of these. Here we have a very rare variety where it's uh, open letters. So that, uh, I've only seen a couple of those. All right, now we go to Oriole. Here's your very first Oriole. It says uh, copyright 1923 down at the 6 o'clock position. Orange label. Uh, the uh, date on the bottom is now gone. We go from the orange label to a black label. Definitely uh, an improvement there. And then we uh, go to uh, a later label with uh, uh, maroon. Maroon was a very, very popular uh, label color. You see an awful lot of labels using that. Now this is a very rare label and uh, really attractive. I'm just going to show the whole record here. The Ormsby Disc. This is an international record company pressing. Uh, International Record Company did a lot of client label work uh, around 1905, 6, thereabouts. Uh, some of them are very common, uh, but Ormsby is very rare. This is the only copy of an Orms, Ormsby I've ever had. Uh, and just that hot pink color is very striking, kind of like uh, your Lambert cylinders. That is a V condition record, which is not terribly high on the grading scale, but it does have a $200 minimum bid. Somebody will be happy to give that a new home. We go to Oxford. Oxford is uh, a Sears and Roebuck company uh, house brand and uh, was pressed by some different companies. Uh, here's an Oxford label that has some uh, patent information down below, as does this one. This one adds some uh, patent information here at uh, 3 and 9 o'clock. Uh, now we lose that whole ornamentation down below. And we just have uh, semicircular uh, printing at the bottom. Okay, this next record is label is really cool. Certainly one of my favorites. Will be one of yours too. The pan label. A nice triangular label. Isn't that awesome? Problem with the pan label is that uh, if you get a steel needle it hits across there then it does definitely uh, is very prone to needle runs so to find a really nice condition pan label that hasn't been screwed up by a needle is kind of hard to do uh, fortunately your flip side also has a very nice label so somebody took care of this you can see it's in amazing condition how's that look to you there Raquel? it looks gorgeous yeah that uh, that is an E minus copy. You will probably be hard pressed to find a better quality example of pen than that example right there. Uh, 
I should mention that we do have uh, the lovely and very talented, very smart, very accomplished, very helpful, uh, engaging, um, and so forth, um, Raquel Marsh here joining us today on the camera. Uh, Raquel, welcome to the uh, Knox Vintage Records, Vintage Record Auction 74, and auction highlights reel. Thank you. Not related to Orlando Marsh, unfortunately. Oh, boy. That's a good point. That is unfortunate. But, yeah. you know, it's close. Very close. So, uh, we, uh, we are welcoming Raquel here. Uh, we don't have Jack this time because, unfortunately, Jack had to head up to uh, Indiana uh, for some family issues in May. Uh, and he's uh, now uh, working at a... Uh, uh, theater doing uh, booking and so forth for uh, for their various acts and uh, and and thing things and we wish him well and uh, I tell you we uh, we had Jack here for probably about six years and he uh, he became indispensable to our operation um, but fortunately Raquel came on board uh, a little over a year ago and was here long enough to be trained by Jack in all kinds of stuff that need to happen around this place. Stuff that I don't even know anything about, like what she's doing right now. And uh, so she has uh, picked up the role of uh, transfer engineer for people who need recordings, videographer, data entry, uh, certainly box packer, uh, seed bank puller, I, I don't know, whatever Whatever we need done around here, she uh, she's kind of become Girl Friday. So uh, very, very glad and blessed to have her here. I'm glad to be here. She's glad to be here. Really, she is. And she didn't sound very excited, but she's very excited. <laughs> we have a good time. All right, so let's get to uh, Paramount. Paramount is another label, American label, that... Uh, Earliest issues uh, are uh, vertical, and this one right here, I have a hard time reading it upside down, it says, this is a vertical cut record made in our own laboratories. Use a steel or tungsten needle. See envelope for position of sound box. So instead of showing you how to position the sound box on the label, you'd have to look at the sleeve. Uh, but they did show you a top of a Paramount phonograph here that the Eagle is standing on top of. Um, these are not uh, terribly rare, but they're somewhat unusual. And as you can see, they're a little bit smaller than a 10-inch record. So they don't quite fit into uh, a 10-inch, or they fit in, but they're loose in a 10-inch sleeve. They don't quite fit into a 9-inch sleeve because they're a little oversized. Uh, when Paramount was starting out, they were just issuing the same sort of popular stuff that everybody else was. Uh, they didn't start doing the blues until sometime later. Uh, Golden and Hines, you know, a couple of acoustic recording artists that were very uh, common, very popular at that time that you would find on uh, Edison Diamond Disc, Columbia's, what have you. More of the same, and they start getting away from the vertical, and they start doing the uh, lateral and so forth. Uh, again, the differences of these on these records are uh, pretty minimal, but if you're a label freak like I am or was, then you would be uh, interested in noting those. And for people, of course, who are concerned about strictly original pressings, then that sort of thing can make a big difference. Okay, so uh, your first uh, pair of mounts were black, as we just saw. Uh, then they switched over into these uh, blue and gold uh, color combination. Again, these are primarily just popular stuff. Slightly smaller label, smaller than what one normally sees. Usually when that happens, it's because the... Uh, the length of recording got to, uh, so close to the grooved area that they couldn't uh, apply a regular label and had to make a smaller one. There we go. And now we have a red variety and a green variety. Uh, the idea of doing green records for Ir Irish uh, content was something that several companies adopted. 
All right, this is an interesting paramount. This we has uh, this black swan indication on the top. So Paramount uh, bought the rights to the Black Swan catalog from Harry Pace, and uh, the Black Swan logo with the swan appears at the top, but you also you still have the wings of the eagle coming out. So it's kind of an interesting idea. So you have kind of four wings going on here, uh, and then you see. Uh, Formerly number, and then this would have been the Black Swan catalog number. So they were very uh, uh, public about that particular acquisition of that catalog and trumpeted that on the records themselves. So that's kind of interesting. Okay, moving along with the whole Black Swan or the whole Paramount series, you go from this blue to this kind of a purpley matte almost almost looks fuzzy textured uh label that was used on a lot of your 12,000 series uh race records uh, these don't hold up real well to uh to water they stain pretty easily they they kind of get marked up fairly easily and they tend to get a little bit ratty over a period of time as you blues collectors very well know and we have a red one but then when they switched over to the black and gold like everybody else was doing then the, those problems went away and they look really great okay what was it that looked pretty pretty enticing iva smith rising sun blues paramount one two four three six in e minus condition mark writes on here clean pay attention clean 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 very nice record with a 250 dollars minimum bid all right, that was lot number 399. Okay, this is a foreign uh, German uh, path issue or paramount issue. Once uh, once Paramount label had closed down, uh, some years later, it was bought uh, by Max Steiner, who ish reissued the label in a 14,000 series with both uh, original Pathé uh, material as well as some uh, of his own uh, freshly recorded material. And those can be distinguished easily by the silver print. Even though those are, are later recordings, uh, they still bring a pretty good price. So uh, you can expect to pay, in nice shape, $50 and up for those, depending on the condition and the content. I mentioned that Parlophone had been purchased or uh, uh, brought in as a label uh, name by the uh, Columbia slash OK slash Odeon group. Um, your uh, uh, Parlophone issue, American Parlophone issues, had a PNY prefix and um, had the same kind of fare that you would find on a uh, similar OK or Odeon, typically jazz and dance band kind of material. Parlophones are kind of scarce labels of those issues and certainly very collectible. Okay, that brings us to Pathé. By the way, Parlophone. That's the only Parlophone issue that I have to show you because that's really the only one that was produced here in the United States. On the other hand, Parlophone uh, in Europe and England was a huge label. It spanned a lot, of, a lot of years and with many, many different label variations and genres and artists and colors and so forth. So fortunately, we're not doing uh, European uh, labels we'd spend an afternoon just looking at parlophones. Same can be said with Pathé because Pathé was a French company uh, that started selling records here in the U.S. in the teens. And the Pathé Actuel is actually a, a, a later record than the first Pathés that were produced in the United States, but those tend to be larger sizes, and so that's why we're not seeing them here. And they would have the uh, kind of recessed. Uh, pigment filled labels uh, that you would see in France were also here 
issued here in the United States. But those are typically going to be larger sizes, and that's why we don't have them here since we're only doing 10 inch. So we're going to jump straight into the Pathé Actuel series. The Actuel uh, moniker was was uh, used for their lateral uh, issues. So they started off with a very attractive uh, label with a red rooster at the top. Again, that would have been kind of an expensive thing, so eventually that was dropped. Um, see various examples of what that looked like. Various little label changes. And here we have gone now to a uh, black where we lose some of that ornamentation and color to make it cheaper both the black and gold and the maroon and gold once again we see black and gold and maroon and gold being a very very prominent combination adopted by a lot of com companies here's another uh, laughing record it would be a different laughing record than uh, the okay laughing record but it's the same idea I think we played that in our last show when we did the bodily noises section. I remember that. Did we do that? Yep. We had a lot of fun with that. That was a that was a highlight for a lot of our listeners. As it turns out, they loved uh, loved that idea. All right, another uh, one of those. Now, this uh, is a vertical pathé. So. A lot of this material was issued both as as lateral and vertical formats. So you're going to have uh, different uh, labels for each one. This is a label uh, very reflective of what a French pathé label would have looked like. And anything you see with a label like this is going to be a vertical uh, pressing. Raquel, how am I doing in terms of getting these uh, positioned properly on the uh, court? Pretty good. Uh, you could, I guess, put them slightly more to the right, to your right. To my right, okay. Very slightly. How's that? Is that where we're going? That was a little too much. There you go. Mm. There you go. Okay. Uh, all right. Path a needle cut. Needle cut is a term that was used, you can see that right here, to denote a lateral record for which you would use a steel needle. And uh, not all the companies really picked up on that. Pathé did. And when Edison finally introduced uh, a regular 78 RPM record, uh, they also called theirs needle cut. All right, so those are, here's a, show you that beautiful sleeve. Pathé had really, really nice looking sleeves. And for people who collect sleeves, we got some really good ones in this catalog. All right. There is a Peerless record. Peerless was an early Leeds and Catlin uh, pressed recording that was double-sided. Most of your Leeds uh, records were single-sided. And uh, I don't know if you can pick this up or not, Raquel, but there's a little number here, five-digit number beginning with four. That's a good clue that it could be a Leeds record, especially if it is in a uh, mirror uh, configuration as we see here. Can you Maybe get that? Maybe if you tilted it a little bit so it could catch the light more. There we go. Just barely. You can tell that there's something there. Okay. All right. Another attractive label, Pennington. Perfect was a company that was uh, uh, a lateral label pressed, recorded and pressed by the Path A company. Your first ones were pretty simple. This is a very simple one, which loses the hexagonal border, but again, that's because we have grooves that got so close they had to trim the labels down. So that is not really an official label variety. For instance, on the flip side, we see what it would, should look like. And then this is a, a later perfect label. It has these uh, kneeling maidens at the top with kind of a sun ray background, which would uh, 
predominate on the perfect label for a pretty long period of time. And there are some variations in this uh, logo at the top that uh, you will note if you study the labels carefully. Perfect entered, uh, introduced their star series label, so they replaced the Maidens with a star. And these were done for uh, Lee Morse and uh, Cliff Edwards, and maybe a couple of other artists who were predominantly uh, very, very uh, prominent uh, personality artists. So they got star series designation. Again, each one of these may look the same, but there's something a little different going on with it. Okay, now we get into our 1930s ARC uh, pressings. ARC was a uh, Kind of a conglomerate group of labels, uh, which included Perfect, Melatone, Banner, Oriole, uh, and a number of others. Um, and those were issued from the early to uh, mid to late 1930s. Uh, so what do we see? We just saw a black one, I think. Yeah, and then we, they switched over to a purple label. Then they switched over to a blue label. Uh, still with the same uh, maidens here at the top at 12 o'clock. And then finally we get a uh, an updated label. All that's now gone. And our last iteration of the perfect label. You'll notice on these later pressings we have a catalog number which uh, is hyphenated 7-11-08. That is actually kind of a code. It, it does serve as the actual catalog number. 7 stands for 1937. 11 stands for the month of November. And 08 stands for the issue number within that month. So this is the eighth issue in uh, November of 1937 for this particular series. Um, so that, uh, that's how you read those. All right, here we go uh, with the Fantasy Concert record. It's kind of a scarce label. Fantasy Concert discs are very prone to fading. The gold oxidizes fairly easily and they get uh, difficult to read. These are actually a couple of very nice uh, examples. Those, those are hard to find. This is a late 30s uh, Air Chief Philharmonic, maybe around 1940 or so, and one in uh, maroon. And then uh, the Air Chief designation was dropped. It just became Philharmonic. Here is a another uh, vertical label, Phonocut Record Company. Now this one is a nice label for uh, phonograph collectors because this is the phono lamp, and here you see a table model phono lamp pictured on the label. Uh, phono lamps are actually phonographs that uh, have a phonograph built into the base with doors that open up, and you could play your your record underneath the lamp, which is kind of cool. Uh, then they also, uh, well, they made several different uh, models of that. And people who collect phonographs and have phonolamps are always on the lookout for phonograph, uh, phonolamp records to play on them, or at least to go with them. I wouldn't necessarily want to play one on there because they're kind of rare. Um, Phonograph Recording Company out of San Francisco. It's kind of, kind of a. It's not a rare label because the the issues that they produce do turn up, but they did not do very many issues on that label. Here is a vertical player phone. Here's a label that uh, is sought after by jazz, blues, country guys, Polk. 
uh, because there's some pretty scarce stuff that was issued on here. This one is Ann Jones, it looks like, on a piano solo. Um, but we will show you what the sleeve looks like. This has a sleeve with it. Polk sleeves are pretty scarce. Well, the records themselves are scarce, so the sleeves are even much more so. Nice sleeve with a little bit of tape on the right side, but uh, otherwise in very, very nice condition. Okay, let's go to our next group. Alright, we're going to a popular hit. This, I believe, is an Emerson product. Uh, a very obscure uh, label. You're not going to see that very often. Here is a Princess uh, vertical. Anytime you see Sapphire on a label, that means it's vertical uh, and is uh, played with a Sapphire stylus. Here is the Princess Grand Opera record for that for their series of that. This is Publix. Publix is a uh, label that was used by uh, Publix theaters to sell recordings of music featured in films that would have been playing in their theater. So uh, these are not original soundtrack or original cast. Uh, recordings but so like this one is until the end from so this is so this is what does it say so this is college so that would have been the movie that this thing is from but it's not actually in the movie it was just a recording of the tune by another band we have a whole series of these we call these movie promo discs and you will find a movie promo disc section in this catalog. We'll show a few more of those later. Here's Puritone. Now we get to Puritan. Puritan was a uh, label uh, closely related to Paramount. And uh, a lot of uh, the same material came out on Puritan as well in the early years. These started out as vertical recordings. In fact, you see the words vertical cut in red here to alert you to the fact that uh, this is not a lateral cut record because they did have the same kind of label uh, featuring lateral material. So again, they wanted to make draw your attention to the uh, point that you need to be sure you're playing it on the right type of phonograph with the right setting and the right stylus. So here we have the same thing without uh, the vertical notification. A lot of these uh, labels, when you really look at the details, can be very interesting. So we have a Puritan machine uh, on these early labels that's just your typical upright type of phonograph. But you're going to see that phonograph change in the logo as, uh, as we progress chronologically. And again, my, uh, my glasses are not doing me any favors so much right now, but uh, you might be able to pick it up in the, uh, in the video. But that, that, that Puritan machine is going to change into a machine that swells out at the base, which was a distinctly Puritan feature for some of their models. Here you have just a straight upright machine shown. I can see that logo. Uh, very nice Puritan sleeve with this record. And here's another example of that. I don't know if you can see it, Raquel, but if you see a, one of those machines that I'm referring to... It looks it, like we're still on the machines with the straight edges. How about that one? That's one of the ones that swells. So you can see the machine there on your uh, left side right here. It has... My, my AMB will see a little bit better on this one. Mm-hmm. So those, uh, those, those machines had a horn that goes, the neck of the horn goes from the tone arm all the way down the back of the machine and then curls forward so that your sound is coming out of the bottom of the machine as opposed to the top like you would see on a Columbia, Victor, Brunswick, or whatever. Eventually we went to something a little bit different. In fact, 
I guess that's what this was, right? Yeah, so we lost that whole design altogether and it became America's best record. Is that what it says? Yep. Mm -hmm. Gonna have to help me out there, Rico. Uh, now we get a Puritan himself. Okay, so totally different label design. Here's another one of the others in blue. Another uh, another label redesign. This is getting to be pretty late. This is from around 1927. Okay, now let's go to Pure Tone. Play with a steel needle. But this was still a vertical recording. Here's Puritone. QRS. QRS, as uh, many of you probably know, was a company that uh, pr produced and sold piano rolls. That was their, their big deal. Uh, they also got into the record business for a period of time. And... Uh, a lot of times you will see a roll number on this early one. Don't see it on there. That's a very early QRS label. Your later QRS labels, a little bit more familiar to most collectors, is that one which featured some really great uh, jazz blues type music. All right, what do we have here? Pax Male Quartet, because I love him. $25 minimum bid on that for a sacred issue. Then we have the Kova QRS, which is a QRS label that uh, has no apparent relation to the ones we just looked at. Uh, little is known about the Kova Corporation. Here's your very first Radiax. No real design to speak of. Then we get, go to one with kind of a chain uh, border around the edge. And these have a lot of different combinations between the color of the printing, the color of the label, um, the color of the um, record content down at six o'clock, so, for instance, here we have gold on orange with black printing. Here we have gold on orange with gold printing. Um, we've gotten away from the chain border, and now we have a uh, solid border. Um, this record looks pretty beat, because it is, uh, but it's a scarce label variety to find a radio, Radiax with that uh, gold label, or gold uh, solid border. Very uh, much nicer Radiax label in my opinion. You can clearly see the Grey Gull connection. Grey Gull Press Radiax is one of their uh, one of their labels. Radiax went through all kinds of different colors and combinations even to the degree of getting into colored wax. So we've got colored wax, colored label, whatever. Then we go to that Radiax. And finally their last variety. Finally got into something that was really pretty, I think. As their swan song. Okay. Now we're going to look at Radio. Radio was a label featuring uh, a lot of sides by Benny Bell, kind of a novelty slash some, sometimes somewhat risque type of label. In fact, it says Novelty Records on the label on that one. 
these are going to be very late 30s, 40s pressings. Okay, now here's a, an interesting label, Radio Tone. So uh, Radio Tone, I don't think, was ever really commercially sold. Uh, therefore, the labels are not terribly attractive. They weren't really designed to be attracting uh, dollar bills out of the pockets of their customers. These were, uh, I believe, designed for radio airplay as kind of a music library thing. And uh, some of the uh, records indicate that, but they can be a little bit interesting. So look at this one. Raquel, see if you can read to me what it says right here under Jean Cardos. Can you pick that out? Yes. Licensed for performance by Broadcast Music Incorporated. Clearly that is a radio uh, license statement. BMI and ASCAP were two big uh, organizations that controlled music rights and uh, it was very important for broadcasting purposes. So this is basically giving you the BMI notification here, which is something that you might see on a radio transcription. But now read what it says under that. Let's see. Licensed by the manufacturer only for non-commercial use on phonographs in homes. So now it's giving you a, non, uh, a license for only non-commercial use in a home. So now which is it? Is this to be played at home or is this to be played in the uh, studio? Well, apparently on this record it's to be done bo both ways. I don't, I don't really understand that. Doesn't make any sense. I've never seen anything like that before. If we look at this variety, we don't have anything down there at all, but now we have this at the top. What does that say? That says performance rights licensed by Broadcast Music Inc. Okay, so now we go back to uh, a, uh, a radio broadcast notification. So I still believe that these are primarily uh, meant for radio use, but perhaps they were uh, also offered for sale in some way. At least one or two of the records that I just showed you only appear on this label. These uh, a couple of these are ARC pressings from the 30s, uh, and uh, the same kind of dance band uh, tunes that you would expect to find on a Perfect or Melotone or Oriole or what have you, but um, but not issued on any of those labels. So these radio tone things have some stuff on there which is really good music, which uh, which you're not going to be able to find on a commercially issued pressing. In fact, we played one of these uh, on the Bitter Request show. This one, 19. 37 with Gene Cardos, that's a vocal by B. Wayne. So really a, a great record and uh, another reason why you might want to tune into the Bitter Request show. So this is a very interesting, we're going to go into Rainbow. Rainbow was a uh, Homer Road Heaver uh, operation. Uh, Homer was a Christian evangelist and toured around with Billy Sunday back in the uh, late teens, 20s. Very, very, very uh, popular, well-known duo. Uh, Road Heaver handled the music and Billy handled the preaching. Road Heaver's uh, label was Rainbow and it was started out as an extremely attractive label. Now this is really what it looks like. That's uh, your first Rainbow label. A lot of beautiful color in that. But the flip side is minus the blue printing. And so that's what you get. So we have one color missing on this side. So that's a, a very striking looking label to someone who's familiar with Ray, Rainbow. I had a copy, I think, of Sugar Blues, the Vogue 707, on the front cover of a catalog a number of years ago that was missing, I think, blue. And so you had a big pink picture of uh, Sugar Blues featuring uh, Clyde McCoy and his trumpet. And uh, it was just a really... If you're familiar with that record, and most collectors are because it's the most common Vogue, when you see that, it's like, whoa, what's going on there? Well, it's a printing error. All right, so here we're going to see a series of rainbow records. We notice differences in the rainbow, the musical staff, the wording underneath of various colors and shades. Some of them have more clouds 
in the background and others. Um, and uh, some of them are, are I mean, well, they're all very attractive, but some of them really more so. So right here, the notes in the staff are not that visible. On here, they're very prominent. So a lot of uh, playing around with colors and uh, visual textures. And this one is autographed as well. Sincerely, Homer Roadhaver. Very nice autograph. A lot of times your autographs on these early records are kind of lousy, especially because since a lot of your labels were, were black and glossy, they were autographed with white ink, which tends to flake off, or if you get it wet, it wipes off, it dissolves. Uh, to find a, uh, an autograph with just a regular ink pen uh, in this way, you know, that's not going to get damaged. So uh, that makes it very nice. All right, another variation on the theme. And then uh, eventually they succumbed to monetary pressures as well and gave up the expensive labels and went to, again, your typical dark red slash maroon and gold color scheme. And then Rainbow was re uh, uh, introduced somewhere in the post war period. Uh, with an entirely different label scheme uh, altogether. Also uh, operated by Mr. O'Hugh. Another minor variation of that particular variety. Okay, here's a label that looks kind of homemade. I mean, it looks like somebody drew that in their uh, dining room or something. I mean, at least it does to me. Ricola, Hollywood. Um, and it was kind of a shoestring sort of a deal. It was a, a label that was actually created by a guy to feature new tunes by people who were songwriters. Uh, you would not find Irving Berlin and Harold Arlen on something like this, but you might find, you know, Mabel Franks down the street or uh, Barney Schlitzberger, his song. <laughs> So, you know, you could send in a song to a Ricola, and if they liked it enough, they'd press a record out of it. So you'll find some, some musical material on Ricola that you're not going to find anywhere else. All right, here we got uh, Record Guild. Uh, so this, I think, was kind of a subscription sort of a deal. Uh, Regal. Regal was a pretty plain and simple label. label. Not a whole lot of changes there. Uh, uh-oh, looks like they're getting a little crazy here. Go to a maroon one, and that's, that's it for Regal. Regis, Remick Perfection. This is a Columbia pressing. You'll see this little uh, publisher's royalty tag uh, on uh, some of your teens' uh, labels by Columbia, including Standard. The odd spindle hole standard, that is, and uh, regular Columbia pressings and so forth. And uh, usually, let's see if you can, can you read that, uh, Raquel? It's read the, the little sticker, publishing rights or something. It says, copyrighted record, additional price. Is yeah, so they add there? a little, a few pennies to the price of the record to cover the uh, the copyright publishing charges. Okay, Remington. That's a, a very cool and very rare label. So, Remingtons are vertical. You will see that they have uh, the price on the label very prominently featured. 50 cent record just in case you were wondering 50 cent record that's how much it is these are very very early star piano company pressings out of richmond star was a company that gave birth to the Jeanette label so uh, a very very uh important uh indie label we call it the first indie label and uh uh but the remington uh label is something that very very few Jeanette collectors have ever seen or heard of. Uh, typically featuring material that your Jeanette collectors are probably not going to be interested in, so I guess that's just fine. So your 10-inch Remington label 
here is a small one. Here's another one, which is uh, much larger. Same idea. 50 cent record. They also did a seven inch vertical record. And that one says 35 cent record. And we will get to that when we feature our uh, seven inch records in a future auction. This is a Remington label, which uh, is, uh, I think, unique. I think these are the only, this particular selection artist is the only one that was issued with this label. You don't see a catalog number. It says a dollar. So this is probably a uh, more of a special pressing vanity sort of thing, which really means it doesn't belong in this collection as I don't think it was really a, a commercially issued thing. Uh, but, hey, there it is anyway. Okay, Republic. This is a very rare label. Uh, again, standard size spindle hole. When I say standard, I mean, if you look, if the, the actual definition of standard would be this, because that's your, st quote, standard uh, spindle size. When I say standard in relation to this larger hole, I'm talking about the standard uh, talking machine company, which produced a phonograph that had a one half inch spindle hole such that you could not play a regular 78 record. You'd have to buy records from them in order to play on your phonograph. And uh, there are a couple of different uh, labels that uh, actually were making recordings for the standard label and only phone or for the standard phonograph, and the only phone that we saw earlier is one of those. This is a Republic, and it's got a very, very uh, Columbia-looking uh, feel to it. It looks very much like a black and silver label Columbia. But I don't think it is. I think... What did we determine on this? IRC, maybe? Or... Star? I, I don't recall. Maybe it'll say in the catalog. Look it up. It's lot number 512. Okay, but uh, nevertheless, whatever it is, it's a very rare label. Here's Rizona. Rizona got real crazy with the redesign. They changed this little uh, kind of triangular looking uh, tail here to the A to a fatter tail. Isn't that nice? I mean, wouldn't you rather buy one of these? than one of these? Yeah, I'm thinking. So, I don't know. Guy, guy in the uh, art department had to justify his paycheck. Now that's an improvement. I like that much better. And you've got uh, colored wax there as well to go with it. So that's a pretty, pretty cool looking record. We'll give that one an A. Alright, now we go to Rex, a uh, another vertical brand. Again, we see changes in the phonograph at the top. So here we have a Rex machine. It's got your typical little grill there covering the uh, uh, phonograph itself. Replaced by one here with no grill. And if you look at the bottom, use only sapphire point on this record. So this one you would be playing with a sapphire ball. Okay. This one says jewel point. I'm not exactly sure why they say jewel point. It means the same thing as sapphire. All right, moving on to uh, more Rexes. Here we have play with a Rex sapphire needle. Yeah, not just any old sapphire needle. Now you now you got to use one of ours because of course this is the record of quality. All right, now we're going to show you one of the highlights in this catalog. For some people, this this would not mean anything, but as a label guy, I when I first saw this, I just about fell out of my teeth. This is lot number 520. You'll see it on the cover of your catalog. This is the only copy of in existence that I'm aware of, and wow, am I happy that it happened to be in E plus condition. Just a beautiful, beautiful record. The Rexall label. This was a pattern label 
created by the Grey Gull Company, probably to pitch to Rexall executives that, hey, maybe you guys need to be having your own record label brand in your drugstores. Well, apparently the pitch didn't go very far because that never happened. But that's what the record looks like. Just a, a wonderful record for a label collector. You will be the only person to have Rexall represented in your collection if you wind up purchasing this copy. Now, I can't guarantee that there's not another Rexall record out there. I'm sure that they had to have pressed more than one. But I've never heard anyone who has seen or who owns a copy of this label. Flipside is in good condition. It has some very, you might not even be able to see it. Oh, it's actually on the side I was showing you. Uh, very light little stain, maybe a little water or something got on the label. Certainly not uh, of any importance. And I don't see it on this side. I had this side up because we actually played this record on the Bitter Request Show since uh, Mark actually does live in the Sleepy Hills of Tennessee. And I'm sure he'd probably love to add that record to his collection. Okay, moving right along. Rhythm Records. Oh, now here's a label that uh, will get uh, a collector's heart beating. Rialto. It's not going to beat based on this record. This is the... It's not... I was going to say it's a more common label. It is more common, but it's not at all common. Rialto is a very scarce label. Uh, but this is the more common of the varieties that you will see. Uh, that's a blue and gold. Here is an ethnic black and gold example. But this is the Rialto that you're wanting to see. This is the one featuring Jelly Roll Morton, London Blues, a legendary recording. Unfortunately, this particular record has a crack in it, which is why it's in a sleeve taped to a piece of cardboard. You can see the crack right here. It's been rather crudely repaired and stabilized with glue. Uh, but it does play through with a thump. I played it the other day for a guy who wanted me to play it for him over the phone so he could uh, determine what that thump sounded like. And he agreed that it's, uh, it's not terribly intrusive. Uh, so if that's a record that you're looking for and like who isn't, uh, you might consider this copy with a $250 minimum bid because if you find a uh, really nice copy of that, it's going to be 10 times that amount. And then here is another Rialto record with that type of label uh, with a German piece. A Rialto, you're going to get much cheaper. $50 minimum bid on this. No cracks. Okay, Rich Tone. And then Reichel. Reichel or Rochelle is another vertical record, a uh, vertically recorded record, which came out in uh, several different types. You will find both 10 and 12 inch Rochelles. And uh, this is your uh, red and gold label, kind of hard to read. This is another one of those labels where the gold tends to fade or oxidize fairly easily and rendering them very difficult to make out. Uh, this is a much nicer Rochelle label. Again, you have a guy with a phonograph at the top. That is a phonograph, isn't it, Raquel? A lot of these are actually phonograph manufacturers, yeah. first and foremost, that contracted with companies to create their own label to sell with the phonographs they were making. So this is kind of a line drawing and this looks more like a, a dot matrix type of screen print up here. Maybe taken from a photograph. I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not into printing. A but lot more detail. More detail, but, but a little bit more difficult to make out. RMC, uh, you probably can't tell. Probably looks black, but this is a deep purple. And here's one with red. Romeo. 
Romeo Electric Record. A lot of these labels that I've shown you, uh, the variation might be the addition of the uh, electric uh, notification on the label to indicate that they are now being recorded electrically and therefore you get better sound. Some labels actually put electrical recording on their labels when they weren't actually electrically recording. Huh. wonder why they would do that. Okay, here's a later Romeo. That's uh, another ARC brand. Ross Stores. Royal. This is another... Leeds Catlin double sided pressing. Royal as opposed to Royale. And a red Royale. And just for grins, a very much later Royale LP from the 1950s. Even though my uh, record collection and the archive here pretty much concerns pre-World War II recordings. In some cases I did go beyond that particular period of time when the label started uh, pre-war and then I just kind of filled it out with later examples like DECA for instance. Uh, but I wasn't real aggressive looking for the post-war varieties. That covers all of our American labels. We use the term our very loosely around here uh, certainly in a bitter request show, an hour could be anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes. Uh, just depends on how things are going. So when I say hour, I just mean uh, we're going to uh, close this particular part of the Noction Highlight Reel for Vintage Record Auction 74. And we will pick it up shortly with further sections in the catalog.